Thanks for the intro. You should have re reminded my time at Stanford, as uh, Professor uh, Eisen said, my best uh, six months of my life. Uh, so uh, back to human. Uh, I'm interested in studying the tumor microenvironment. Uh, I'm engaged in several projects in this realm. I'll try to tell you about one of them today. Uh, so we all know that the tumor is not just cancer cells, but there's always the mutation and the endes need to replicate, but also a large, a large component of supporting cells, such as uh, blood vessels and uh, uh, cells from the immune system. And uh, in the last few years, this has been the focus of cancer research, uh, probably because of the emergence of the immunotherapies, the immune checkpoint blockades and other uh, immunotherapies which uses this uh, microenvironment to fight the tumor. Uh, about a year ago, there was a meeting in Google X of uh, experts in this field and for searching uh, for ways to boost cancer immunotherapy. And uh, they ultimately decided, the group ultimately decided that the field's most pressing need was to ramp up the development of better tools to distinguish between uh, patients who respond to a cancer immunotherapy from those who do not. So this is my motivation uh, for studying the tumor microenvironment, and uh, I'm trying to use my bioinformatic skills uh, just to help in this problem. I think it's important to understand that until recently, bioinformaticians couldn't really study the tumor microenvironment because all the data that we had, we had was on cell lines. So we had amazing databases like the ENCODE and uh, other databases, but there, were, there was no microenvironment. But in recent years, there is uh, a lot of new data that comes from primary tissues and uh, tumors, and uh, mainly we have the Cancer Genome Atlas, where now we can uh, start studying the tumor microenvironment. So we wanted to start with a very, very simple problem, the tumor purity, which is the percentage of tumor DNA in the sample. Uh, and uh, this was published a couple of months ago, so you can uh, read it. When we started thinking about this problem, we understood that there are both opportunities and uh, threats in tumor purity. It's an opportunity if you look at, at the purity of the tumor as an intrinsic factor. And then it's a phenotype. It characterizes the tumor, and it might have clinical relevance. But on the other side, it's a threat if you look at it as an intrinsic factor, a contamination of the sample, not the tumor. And then it will confound our genomic reasoning. And um, my first part of the talk will be about the opportunity, the second will be on the threat, and I hope to show that this threat is also an opportunity. So how do you estimate tumor purity? So the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas allows us to use all the different omics characterizations to do that. We have this amazing database that we have for 10,000 patients uh, in many, many different cancer types. We have uh, many, many different omics characterizations, and we can estimate tumor purity using the h and &E slides. We can use, it, can use the somatic mutations or copy number variations. We can use gene expression. We can use DNA methylation. And we can also combine all of them together. So this is what we did. We took uh, data for almost uh, 10,000 tumors in uh, 21 cancer types, solid tumors. And we took uh, algorithms, the estimate algorithm that uses gene expression, the absolute algorithm that uses copy number variations, our in-house DNA methylation method, and h and &E slides, we combine them all together to create something that we call CPE, or consensus purity estimate. So uh, we plotted this plot of the tumor purity in all the samples across the 21 cancer types. And you can see here two, uh, two important things. First, there are major differences between cancer types. There are some cancer types that are very pure, those from, that emerge from the brain, for example. And there are some cancer types that are very not pure, for example, lung and also uh, bladder and breast and other cancer types. But the other important thing to see here is that there are major differences in, in cancer types. So if you look, for example, uh, this works. In uh, melanoma, you can see patients' tumors with very, very small, uh, little purity, and also uh, tumors with very high purity. And another thing that you can see here, you can see this 60% uh, line. So uh, TCGA has a minimum, minimum requirement of 60% that they use, uh, that pathologists are estimating. Uh, but you can see here that many of the samples have much lower than 60%, which could be a problem. 
So the first question that we uh, wanted to ask is whether this has clinical relevance. So we used all the clinical data that uh, is available in TCJ. There's a lot of clinical data. And we tried to look whether there is some correlation with tumor purity. And uh, my, uh, my result is that there is not much. Uh, what we did find is a correlation with histological subtypes and histological grades. But this is, again, histological subtypes is, again, just looking at different cancer types. So you have, uh, for example, in, uh, lung, uh, lower, uh, in lower grade glioma, you have major differences between astrocytoma and oligodendoglioma, which are two uh, different subtypes. But those are just different. Uh, it's like looking at different cancer types. So it's the same thing that we saw in the plot before. In histological grades, it's a different story because it's actually the opposite of what you will expect. You will expect that higher grade, it's easier to differentiate, and then you will have higher purity, but actually you see the opposite. Uh, we don't exactly understand this. Uh, we also saw some correlation with, purity, with uh, survival, but I think that this is, again, just as looking at different cancer types because, again, lower grade glioma, those with uh, very good prognosis are oligodendoglioma, which have higher purity and also better uh, prognosis. But back to this plot, and when I saw this plot the first time, it reminded me uh, this plot that I'm sure that if you've been to, well, we saw it also yesterday, if you've been to uh, talk that talks about immune checkpoint blockades, you must have seen this because uh, there is a belief in the field that cancers with high mutations uh, will respond better or will respond to uh, the immunotherapies. Uh, when, when we put the tumor purity, we correlated with tumor mutational burden, we saw this amazing correlation. Uh, so here is the tumor purity and here is the mutational burden. And uh, you get this great correlation with only few cancer types that are outliers. And I also have, uh, I think, good explanation for what's going on there. And you can ask me later. So what is going on? Why is the mutation burden so highly correlated with, mutational, with uh, tumor purity? And I think that there is some kind of cycle here that we don't uh, understand fully, but tumor purity is, is, well, is a proxy for immune infiltrations. The major part of the non-pure uh, component is, the, is uh, immune cells, uh, which could be uh, a proxy for inflammation which uh, we know that can drive DNA damage, which is mutation, can, is of course correlated with mutational burden. And I think that all of them together are the reason why we see this effect on uh, immunotherapy response. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't limit ourselves to studying uh, only mutational burden when we look at the, uh, the immunotherapy response, but we need to look at all this cycle. Okay, so this was the first part. The second part is tumor purity in genomic analysis, and this is just a simple two example. We have this sample with 90% cancer cells and 10% other type of cell, a normal cell, and we measure some gene and we get 10 reads. We have another sample with 50% uh, cancer cells, and we measure uh, the same gene and we get 50 reads. Without seeing uh, this, a naive explanation will say that this gene is five-fold uh, highly expressed. But when I'm showing you this composition, you understand immediately that this is probably expressed in, from the orange cells. And this will affect all the bioinformatic analysis that we will try to do on genomic data, and I'll focus on correlation clustering differential analysis. So correlation is used, of course, in many, many different uh, ways, but uh, in core expression networks, this is uh, the main component. And here is an example in bladder cancer. We have two genes, JAK3 and CSF1R. Both are driver, cancer driver genes. Both are kinases. And we see here a very strong correlation between them. So uh, we will think that there, are, there is some co-expression between them, but we don't know anything like this, and we don't, we don't think that there is supposed to be some correlation between them. But if you had the purity uh, layer here, so you see that both genes are highly correlated with uh, tumor negatively correlated with tumor purity, and this is why we see a correlation between them. If we add the purity, to, we do a partial correlation with purity, we get a much, much lower correlation, or almost it's abolished completely. So we do this for uh, all the genes in uh, bladder cancer, and this, is, uh, this heat map shows the correlation between uh, each pair of, pair of genes. 
and uh, we get some clusters. So for example, this cluster, we will say that this is a co-expression network, a very big co-expression network, but if we add the purity layer, we see that all those genes, all the genes is pure, this, uh, this cluster are genes that are just uh, very high, highly positively correlated with purity. On the other side, there is this cluster, which is a very strong cluster, and all the genes there are highly co negatively correlated with purity. Well, those are immune genes, and this is why we see them as highly correlated. Using partial correlations, and we'll show it in the paper, uh, removes most of this uh, by at least 50% of the uh, significant correlations. Okay, clustering. So molecular subtyping is widely used in cancer. We try to do it in all cancer that we do. This is from breast cancer, which is most known. But uh, we usually what we do, we take RNA data, uh, expression data, and we do uh, unsupervised clustering, and we try to get different subtypes of the cancer. But the problem is that when you do unsupervised clustering, in, uh, when the main component is uh, the purity or the immune filtrations, what you get eventually is subtypes that are, are just the result of the, of the purity. So here is two examples in glioblastoma and in lung adenocarcinoma. Uh, those are ex accepted subtypes in all cancer that there are uh, attempts to do, but those are widely accepted. And you see major differences between the subtypes and, between, and uh, uh, tumor purity. And this is what you expect, actually, when you do unsupervised clustering. And you can see it also in lung adenocarcinoma. There are 504 genes that are accepted for the clustering. And you can see that almost all of, half of the genes are negatively correlated with purity. So uh, it's a problem. And adding purity for create, when creating the subtypes might be uh, useful. There was a paper uh, a few months ago in uh, New England Journal of Medicine about low grade glioma by, by the TCJ consortia. And they subtyped the low grade glioma based on, and it's three, <laughs> okay, uh, based on uh, IDH1 mutation. And they also used all the uh, comprehensive integrative uh, genomic data that they have. And they concluded that uh, they used the, com we used the comprehensive multi platform genomic approach to deal in the biologic foundations of adult lower grade glioma and concluded that the genetic status was more reflective of disease subtypes than when it was histological. So we based this conclusion on the result of an unsupervised analysis of genome wide molecular platforms. And, they and eventually, what they showed that genetic status gave the same result as in unsupervised molecular subtypes. So, this is probably real. But the problem is that if the genetic status is correlated with some confounding factor, drive conf some confounding factors, and, it, and then if the confounding factor drives the unsupervised molecular subtypes, then this result is very problematic. And this is what we see. If you take the IDH subtypes, you see major differences in tumor purity. So I'm not saying that this is not real subtypes of lower grade glioma, but uh, you understand this confounding factor is tumor purity. Uh, but saying, basing this result on the, of an unsupervised analysis of genome-wide molecular platforms is very, very problematic. And one last thing, differential expression analysis. So uh, here it's not purity, it's percent of non-immune DNA. And you can see here major differences between uh, the tumor and the adjacent normal. And then we can add purity to our, our models for the differential expression analysis. And I'll just show you two, one example in the CTLA-4, the uh, immune, uh, immune checkpoint blockade gene. Uh, so here in kidney, sorry. So here in kidney, uh, if you want, if you look only at the y-axis, you will say that there are major differences between normal. This gene is uh, highly expressed in the cancer compared to the normal. But if you add the purity, you understand that this is just a result of the purity. But when you look at lung adenocarcinoma, you see a very different picture. Because you see here that uh, even if you look only at samples that have 50% purity, which is what we have in the normal samples, you see that the cancer is always uh, expressed higher. Which means that if you want to put the purity, you will only look at the y-axis, you will see, you will think that there is no difference between the normal and the cancer. But after you add the purity, you see this. And uh, when we try to look at pathways that behave like that, we see a lot of uh, T cell activation pathways in many, many different cancer types, which makes it uh, uh, very interesting for uh, further research. 
So, so just to conclude, the influence of tumor purity on the results of genomic analysis is much stronger than previously appreciated and ought to be included as a covariate in any future analysis. Tumor purity differences resulting from sampling variation exceed intrinsic individual differences. Lower purity samples by inf influencing genomic data may make precision medicine efforts more challenging. And we urge cancer researchers and clinicians to take tumor purity into account when analyzing genomic data from patient samples. And just uh, one last slide. Uh, well, I talked about the, the tumor purity as a whole, but of course what we're interested in is to get much, much deeper and to understand what are all the different components in the tumor microenvironment. And hopefully next year I'll be able to elaborate on this. Thank you. We're running a little short on time, but we, I think we have time for one question. Oh, in the back here. Oh, so I was just curious, you had like four different metrics that went into your overall summary. Were some better than others? Was there a way you kind of validated the four? Yeah, so all the three uh, genomic methods are highly correlated with each other, and the H and E slides are very, very different. It's still positive correlation, which shows that there is something in it, but it's very, very low correlate, correlation with the others. Do you like the genomic? Yeah. More? There okay. Are, you can see it on the sample that a lot of the H&E slides, well, take two pathologists, ask them to, to estimate, they will give you completely different measures. So, uh, so H&E slides are not a very good way to get the proportions of uh, the microenvironment. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much.